I was just telling the speakers that the lawn people don't normally come on Wednesdays, but fun surprise, they're here. So I think they're going to be part of the show today. Okay, one more minute and we'll get going. Hi, Kirsten. Hi. All right, we have a jam-packed conversation today. So really excited to kick off this event uh, for all of you. This is Leveraging Data for Retailer Pitches, and this is hosted by Naturally Austin and Naturally San Diego. And I am your, um, your, your you know, kickoff host. My name is Katrina Tolentino. I am the Executive Director of the Naturally Network. And just in case you are new to us, Naturally Network is the largest industry organization convening and supporting the uh, consumer packaged goods community. And we have nine chapters across the country. We have uh, chapters in Austin, Bay Area, Boulder, Chicago, Los Angeles, Minnesota, New York, uh, North Bay, San Diego. And we'll have a couple more uh, coming on soon by the end of the year. So if you have not joined a chapter yet, it's a great opportunity to really connect with your regional community. All right, so today's speakers, really excited to have these three with us today. First up is going to be Kristen Sherman. She has worked in grocery retail for over 20 years, including 11 years at Whole Foods Market. And she is currently the principal local forager for the Southeast and Southwest regions, scouting new trends, innovations, and supporting existing local and emerging supplier partners across all categories of the center store. So today, Kristen is going to be helping all of you navigate the internal Whole Foods ecosystem and share forager insights to help you have better conversations with the buyers that you are working with. So thank you so much for being here, Kristen. Next up is going to be Bobby Turner. Bobby has held numerous roles during his impressive 30 year run at Whole Foods Market and most recently as regional president. And during his career at Whole Foods, I think Bobby, you have had, you've done everything from launched bakery operations to vice president. So I think, you know, you're also an active CPG advisor and Bobby is going to be the voice of the brand today as part of this conversation. So thanks so much for for joining us. And if you're wanting to see who Bobby is on, on your lineup of, um, of squares there, he's Bobby's the one with the lemons. And then last up will be Annie DeBenier. Oh, I got nervous, Annie, I already messed it up. DeBenier, uh, who is with NIQ. She is passionate about helping small businesses grow. And she's, she's currently leading a team of sellers supporting center store emerging brands that have partnerships with NIQ. I know that that's a lot of you here. And he's worked with numerous brands across categories, providing data for growth and supporting brands like you along your journey. And she's going to show us um, reports on the NIQ Visor platform, which by the way, all of you naturally members get three free reports from. So we'll be dropping a link here in the chat for that. And as well as talk about creative ways to make your brand stand, stand out um, with data. So just a quick run through of the show today. Each, of, each one of our speakers is going to have a little bit of time to speak with all of you, share some insights. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bobby to moderate the conversation. But this is really both a blend of webinar and a little bit of office hours, because at the end of the day, we're here to support you, uh, our brand. So make sure to use that chat fun function and, and get your questions in. This is a great opportunity and a great group of, of experts that can, that can support you today. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kristen. Awesome, thanks so much, Katrina. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that great intro. It's kind of a mouthful. So I'm gonna start off by just kind of helping digest my role and unpack it a little bit, what I do and how, um, you know, how, how I work with brands, uh, both local and emerging, and uh, how our team functions and how they uh, collaborate and intersect with specific category merchants um, at Whole Foods Market. So um, first off, uh, as Katrina mentioned, I've been with Whole Foods Market for now uh, just over 11 years grocery retail for over 20, not intended uh, grocery retail career, but here I am and um, found my passion and love it. And really, um, you know, where I 
find my most, my biggest passion is just helping small and emerging brands succeed and help navigate grocery retail. So what I'm focused in on is literally like out foraging, which I'm doing here in Nashville, Tennessee today um, with my other team member uh, who sits in our rally um, market. And we've got 10 foragers peppered kind of throughout the country company-wide and we're kind of, um, you know, filling in white space, seeking innovation, look, looking for new products and um, partnering really closely with category merchants to uh, source and support kind of those innovation pipeline and um, emerging brands and kind of getting a pulse on what's up and com coming in the um, CPG industry, primarily um, in center store, which is what we call for, um, could classify or how we classify grocery and whole body. Um, so really just honing in on, on CPG products. Um, so I work with 37 specific category merchants, I think is the number right now. And, you know, some folks who are looking specifically at maybe condiments or packaged coffee and how we, um, you know, make sure our, our assortment is the most relevant um, and how local and kind of what we call taste of place kind of helps round out the assortment um, from a national scale. So when you think of, so within Center Store, we've identified certain focus categories um, where local is a little bit more relevant and there's some nuance within the category. Um, and again, what we call kind of taste of place. So having our assortment kind of reflect the local community um, and not just for local, but also new and emerging brands. Um, so things that, you know, maybe not ready for scale and third-party distribution and getting into like national retail, but having having a kind of a playground um, to test things out on a smaller level. Um, that's where my team really comes into play. And again, partners with each um, respective category merchant to kind of be that pipeline for innovation and trends. Um, and I guess for today, kind of my main takeaways are, you know, thinking of getting on shelf as the starting line, not the finish line, and just how you, how we use data and look at, um, you know, data outs even before things get on shelf and kind of lean on our brands, our suppliers to know where they stand as they're you know, not only making a successful pitch, but also once they get on shelf, kind of how we use data to make assortment decisions and then leveraging the different programs and sales driving tools that are available in each individual retailer, whether it's Whole Foods Market or another retailer um, to really help drive um, sales, following, performance, traffic, um, and maintain relevancy and just really building that relationship with your point of contact at the retailer to make sure that you're not only getting on shelf, but staying on shelf. That's really um, kind of the name of the game. So, um, you know, we touch each individual category at least once a year to really dive in and see how the assortment's performing and look for opportunities to shake things up, whether it's, um, you know, innovation within that category or, um, and that could be any differentiators from packaging to ingredients to different like you know maybe mission driven attributes of a brand things like that um, so really taking a holistic view at making sure we have the the best most relevant assortment for our customer and our customer is different in different parts of the country and that's kind of where again the forager team kind of intersects and comes into play from the merchant who's looking at spreadsheets and managing data for the category nationwide um, the second takeaway is kind of, again, just to like do your homework and really take you know, oh, ownership and, oh, yeah, do we have a question? Michael? No? No? Okay, we're good. Um, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, just doing, doing your homework and really getting to know your audience, not just for a pitch, but also just to, again, familiarize yourself with the retailers, maybe quality standards. Um, make or break deal breakers in terms of what they're looking for in the assortment. Um, get it going into a store and looking at the set where your product would live to really see who your competition is. Um, just do your homework. That's something that I definitely rely heavily on brands to know, especially with my kind of, you know, bias and narrow point of view as a Whole Foods market buyer, having that more holistic picture from a brand of how you're showing up 
outside of Whole Foods, especially if you're not on shelf yet, um, just be really able to speak to that. And that's where data really comes into play. Um, and then the last piece is, um, you know, again, just knowing where you stand and letting data kind of be your guide um, and utilizing tools to know where you stand. So with, um, you know, having that snapshot in time, Whole Foods Market, I believe, has a pretty unique um, re vendor reporting tool available. But um, looking at category trends, and that's just performance on Whole Foods Market shelves, right? So knowing, like leveraging things like Nielsen IQ and other data resources um, to know where you're at holistically within your space out, outside of Whole Foods or whatever retailer, um, to know where you're at and really keep tabs on that and set and communicate your short and long-term goals with each individual retailer and buyer. So you can really kind of work towards those goals together um, and just stay really engaged. I think one, the, one of the biggest mistakes I see brands make is coming to me um, and just kind of, it's a check off the box and they, you know, they kind of move on to the next thing. I think, um, you know, I'm not only looking for new brands, but also kind of helping foster that early stage relationship on shelf and making sure they're familiarizing themselves with all the resources and tools that are available um, and having a successful launch. So we can, um, you know, kind of grow from there together um, and not just be another number that, um, you know, there's definitely, I, the part of my job that I love the most is the human element of the products we sell. There's always a story. There's always great passion. And, you know, if uh, even better, something like a mission is always great too, just knowing what a brand is about. Since CPG is such a competitive industry, um, you know, how we can help um, share that, like tell that story, share that story, but also perform and, and uh, earn that real estate on the shelf. All right, that was kind of my spiel, but I don't see any questions yet, but I'm happy to answer anything or we can move on to, to Annie's piece. I don't see any questions yet either, but I think Bobby, let's have you go next. I think you have been an advocate for brands and have worked with thousands of brands in your career at Whole Foods. Would love to get some insights uh, from you for this group. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Katrina. And yes, I, I do have a love for bakery, um, <laughs> even though it's been many moons. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, you know, I love what uh, Kristen kind of ruled out. You know, it, it is, it's, it's kind of like a relay race, you know, just getting on the shelf is the starting line. Even though you might be a successful D2C brand or you might be, you know, successful in, um, you know, a different channel, but when you, when you go, go to retail, you know, it's really about, you know, really knowing the category, how the category is performing within that, in that grocery banner, you know, knowing who your, who's your, who's your competition within that, because not only do you need to have a strategy of how you're going to win in that category, but you also need a, a strategy on how you're going to win market share. Uh, I think that's one thing that brands really don't understand is really, you know, the, you know, kind of, you know, really establishing, you know, that market share within that category, because the category could actually be down, but you actually could have an opportunity to, to, to change that around. And that, you know, what I would say would be a win, win, win for the buyer, because the buyer's role is to really drive category growth and to drive category profitability. And so it's really about setting up a, a plan to really do those and, and you, you can't necessarily do that by taking your D2C strategy or, or taking a strategy that you have from another channel and applying it to retail. I, I would say the, the other part that, you know, kind of um, um, line in the, in the Kristen's kind of you know, mantra that she just um, shared is really about having a strong promotional strategy. And promotional strategy is just not necessarily always discounting, but it's also... You have to think that if you're a strong D2C brand, you own your customer base, you own that relationship. Once you go to the retail shelf, you have to find other ways to connect with that, with that, um, that grocery banner's customer base. So it's really about engaging. And if you're a mission-based company, how do your mission, how, how do your, your mission 
uh, based initiatives align with say Whole Foods Market or another banner and you need to you know, build those partnerships together. I think it's really important. I mean, I think what um, Nielsen IQ and, and the Biser, um you know, program does is it really helps, you know, uh, brands kind of outline <clears throat> what, you know, how they're stack in, in that category and how those differentiators are. So differentiators could be gluten-free, it could be, you know, women-owned, um, it could be, you know, regenerative ag, but you really need to think about all those, those, different, those, those different things that your differentiators of your product and how those are gonna align against your competition too, and how that really aligns into your price point and your promotional price point that you're gonna, you're gonna tackle because you don't wanna come in super high in the category and you only you know, drive movement when you're on promotion um, because then what you're gonna do is you're only gonna connect, um, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to, to, to run those promotions in that grocery banner. And I would say, you know, probably the, the last thought that I have, you know, just around early stage brand, you know, early stage brands is, is really about knowing how much money it's going to take to go to retail. And how do you, how do you leverage that, your, the dollars that you do to make, you know, you get the most bang for your buck. Because, you know, going to retail is really expensive. And I just, you know, I had a conversation with a brand last week and, you know, they have three, they're in three different categories. And um, I told them, just go to the category that you know you can win because, you know, it costs so much money. If you know you, you three categories and you're only going to win out of those three, then don't even go to the other two at this time. Win in that one, build brand representation, build brand loyalty, and then you can add into to the different categories down the road once you have brand loyalty. And I think that's really you know, really, you know, and, and it's really kind of understanding, you know, what the buyer is looking for. They're, you know, every buyer is looking for innovation. Um, that's probably the the main comment right now on a buyer. If you don't have innovation, they're not going to listen to you, and they're not going to open your deck, and and they're just not looking for another thing. So you, you know, to to Kristen's earlier point, if you if you're a founder and you have a great mission and you're solving a problem, that opens one door. But you have other doors that you have to open. You have to really understand how you're going to win in that category, and you know, and really, the the aspect of of the importance around discipline around that is just great data, and really kind of coming back to really build a great game plan of what you're going to do to win in that category. I think that's a good segue to go to Annie. It is. You guys stole a lot of my thunder with bringing data into your stories, so I appreciate that. Um, but great to meet everybody today. Um, as Katrina mentioned, I'm from Nielsen IQ. I specifically support um, our small and emerging brand division within Nielsen IQ, um, mostly focused on the Visor platform that Bobby had, had alluded to earlier. Um, I did drop that link where you can get three free reports into Visor, but I kind of wanted to go into, you know, Kristen and Bobby did a great job of why do I need the data? What do I need to bring? But what does that even look like? How do I get there? What do I need to, to get there? And, and, and as Bobby said, it's expensive. What do those investments look like? And, and that's really where Bizer came into life. Um, it was launched in April of 2021, so still a relatively newer platform. Um, but it's, it's intended to be that turnkey one-stop shop for small and emerging brands to grow into retail and beyond. So we've got really basic metrics that you're going to need to start with, things like dollars, units, you know, promotion strategies, velocities, where you can really find those nuggets, where you can be that category expert and, and advise your buyers, here's where we need to make changes at shelf. Here's why you need to bring me in and where my brand is going to add that point of differentiation and increase your velocity, increase your, your category growth. Um, and then beyond then, as you continue to grow into it, we can grow with you with more, um, you know, price elasticity data, 
things that get you a little bit deeper to now really be and solidify yourself as that category advisor for your buyers and for all of your retail partners. Um, so what does this even look like? Um, I wanted to just quickly show you what this Pfizer platform looks like um, just to help conceptualize the tool and, and some of the insights that you can get out of it. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see my screen that says my reports? We got some head nods, awesome. So this is the Visor platform. Um, within the tool, you'll have three free reports. They'll all live in this templated reports. The purpose of this, this solution is to have that turnkey insight where you can get in, make a few points and clicks. You don't need to be an industry veteran. You don't need to be an, an analyst. You don't need to have tons and tons of category experience to get some of those nuggets out of here. So one of the reports that you will have access to within the Visor platform of free script subscriptions is this category and brand trend report. So I pulled this for shelf stable ketchup. This is an area that Kristen's really focused in on for Whole Foods uh, market, the total market for Primal Kitchen. Um, just a fun brand to look at. They've got a lot of growth, but you know, sometimes we also hear, well, how do I even make impact if I'm competing against these big brands or or I don't have this story yet. How do I even get this buyer to pay attention when I'm competing against Primal Kitchen? Um, and there's always, always a nugget. It's just a matter of finding it. So we can see here really key, turnkey visuals. We've got KPIs across the top, a visual representation of sales by four weeks, comparing the focus brand, which again is Primal Kitchen, to the total catch-up category, we can see where the focus brand is under or overperforming in the category. Um, really easily can drag and drop this into a deck and even bring it to a retailer. Hey, what happened in the weeks of 5, 6, 23? Um, where was where was the category dipping below the focus brand or vice versa? Um, and then we can even get down to even more granular data in here, looking at sales by weeks, seeing where those peaks are, um, can even be used to replicate promotional strategies. Hey, this is where my competitors are promoting. Is this a good time to promote or do I want to come take that and promote in opposite weeks? So we, we are different than our com competition. Um, but as we go down looking at some item level data, this breaks it down into weeks as well. And we see a lot of green. I mean, that's great. We see green. Um, but where's our story? Where's our story? We scroll over and we see dollars are up, units are up, distribution is up, but velocity across the board is down. So could that be my golden nugget? Do I want to focus in on that? Um, there's always something that you can tell with this information. Um, so really just more so where you want to focus. And then one other piece that I really wanted to highlight within the tool, tons and tons of reports, but um, we also have a feature called stories. This is my personal favorite item within the database. This is, I like to call them like skeleton decks, ready to go. Make a few clicks, choose your brand, choose your category, choose your retailer, and it will actually spit out a deck ready for you. So here's a category review for Primal Kitchen, for Whole Foods. Um, obviously you would wanna do this for your brand. Um, you can do it across you know, total US if you're not necessarily localized into specific retailers yet, um, or even can look at other brands to just get those nuggets, but can really find some, some of those items without necessarily having to know where to look. Um, I love to just use these to find, okay, how am I performing or where is there opportunity um, to make those assortment and, and data recommendations? So really, really great visuals. I'm not going to bore you with 15 slides of different data points, but um, Visor is just a really, really great tool that can be used, you know, for a ton of different reasons, but but definitely to grow with you as you expand into retailer, um, into retailers. But just overall, my my shameless all plug is always that the data is the cornerstone of your retailer pitch. That's going to give you that depth of and and trust within that those buyers. Being that category expert is so impactful to show that you know what's going on and show where you know where you would fit. Where would my pricing be? How do I differentiate? 
Um, you know, am I a premium? Why? But knowing where you would fit in that category is what actually makes the impact. Knowing your brand and knowing your competition is really, really important in any of those pitches. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annie. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we've really enjoyed about our partnership with you all across all of the Naturally chapters is that, you know, getting access to data is one thing, but making that data bite size so that you understand what you're looking at and then being able to translate it into a deck or a story that supports your conversation that's incredibly powerful so I'm, I'm really glad that that um that you showed that so i think for this portion of the chat i'm already or for this discussion i'm already seeing some questions here in the chat but i'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to bobby to ask to get our, our questions started for the brands here but brands if you're in the audience please feel free to add your questions in the chat we'll we'll call them out as part of this discussion yeah i think <clears throat> thanks katrina uh i'll ask uh kristen one question because I think it's really probably the one she gets the most and you know it's probably one that a, a lot of small brands you know have and you know it's you know if you if you don't have great sales data yet you know what what should the conversations you know that the the brand should be having with you Kristen or the buyer um you know to really you know to to to, to get to that starting point of on the shelf yeah, that's a great one. Um, I think just identifying and owning and clearly communicating also efficiently because you might have 10 minutes or just a snapshot of time to really, you know, your elevator pitch, just how you're going to add value to that retailer's assortment. Um, and we talked a lot about innovation and just to note on that, like innovation doesn't have to be recreating wheels or calling a barbecue sauce something else but like um it could be differentiation in flavor profiles or quality ingredients or um you know every everyone's i see a lot of folks i shouldn't say everyone making their grandmother's recipe of salsa and it's the best salsa uh, according to them mm -hmm. Um, so just like really think about like zoom out and think about from a non-biased perspective like get your you know I, I think a lot of folks do a lot of r d with their friends and their family and are probably always getting positive feedback like oh you should take this to market um it's delicious i would buy this but of course they would they're your friends and your family so get some like non-bias um you know random people honest opinions or, or create an advisory board of people you really trust who you know are going to set it to you straight and find those things that make your product compelling to anyone looking for looking within the set of your category and that is how you pitch to a buyer of how like this is this is how this product why you need it and how it's going to create value into your assortment and yes maybe it's not proven yet in the numbers um but just really lean into that and i think um just touching a little bit too on channel strategy and just who your customer is and how you're going to invest in reaching that customer where they're at where are they shopping what are they looking for um and you know it's it's easy to get distracted and just do you know take any opportunity that comes your way but you have limited bandwidth and being an entrepreneur is a hustle and so just being really strategic and how and who and when and where you're putting your product out there um to really reach the right customer who's going to find it, appreciate it, buy it, and come back for more. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kristen. That's, yeah, go beyond your friends and family. That's for sure. Um, yeah, what, um, Annie, for you, what, what kind of, you know, data you know, would support those conversations based on what, um, you know, Kristen kind of just expanded on? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of those metrics look like, um, you know, when you don't have the data, you're not, you know, your brand is not represented in our, you know, Whole Foods total sample of, of information. What, what else is everybody else doing? How are your competitors growing? Who is growing? Who's not? Are there redundancies at shelf? Um, could you bring something new to the shelf? Um, new, fresh, 
you know, Kristen said innovation a lot of times, you know, that's oftentimes where we find the growth. So how can you bring something different to her shelf? Um, but really looking at, you know, redundancies, underperformers, um, you know, even if the category is growing, could this even, you know, think macro level sometimes too, even, could this be a case where we expand our two foot shelf set? Could we be making a case to our buyer to say, hey, we need three feet in this, in this set, four feet, and I'm going to bring my brand and these other brands in that will continue to drive that velocity. No, that, no, that's great. Thanks, Annie. And I think, well, either Kristen or Annie, it's really about also, you know, how how is how's the brand going to add to the add value to that retailer's assort, assortment too? Whether it's two foot or it goes to four foot, you know, I think that's always a you know compelling you know point that they need to make within you know their ten or twenty minutes but they're not going to gain more, you know, time with the buyer. So they have a short period of time to actually really state that compelling statement. So, um, you know, Kristen or any, what's your thoughts around making that compelling statement about, um, you know, to really sway the buyer of, about, um, you know, winning in that category or really helping that category grow. Yeah, I can just, I will say just showing, I, sometimes I'm looking at not only just a product, but the person behind it. So just how you're having ownership and acknowledgement of how you'll continue to stay engaged and, um, you know, not necessarily getting into details about trade spend, you know, in, in front of the conversation, but just, I feel, I just had kind of having, having some intuition with how driven a brand is to really succeed and understanding that um, you know, it's a, it kind of just like, as, as we've said a couple of times, just it's a marathon that kind of just escalates from day one, right? So just how you're going to maintain, I mean, not, if, you, if your goal is to maintain on shelf in the stores you launch in, that's one thing, but if you're wanting to grow, you know, there's a question from Sam about metrics. Um, you know, there's just so much nuance and numbers these days with like cost of goods and pricing, um, promo strategies, things like that, but like velocity, sales per store selling and units, not necessarily just dollars, but how like maybe you're just in five or a dozen or a hundred stores, but like what's the, the incremental velocity of where you, where your product is and what that's how you kind of start to emerge as an outlier within your category as, okay, this is outperforming other brands on shelf, even if that brand is in 500 doors versus 100 um, in in the stores they're in. So that's that's the opportunity to kind of look at what's next, and that's when we start having having conversations around, um, you know, if we haven't already in third party distribution and maybe other efficiencies and cost of goods and helping kind of grow that brand. Um, but yeah, it's really uh, just how you're kind of adding value both in differentiation and just going to maintain and, and be a, a partnership. You know, I think sometimes as a buyer, you kind of get those squeaky wheels who are just, um, you know, emailing me every week and have questions. So I think there's a, a fine, delicate balance of being like independently, you know, doing the homework, um, being a good partner, and then knowing when to reach out and be like, hey, I'm stuck or I noticed this thing, just really getting a gauge and having, um, exemplifying how you're dialed in and taking ownership and responsibility to drive your own brand success because the retailer can't do that for you. We certain, like retailers certainly have programs where we, you know, share um, initiatives to help bring awareness, you know, off-shelf merchandising, signage, or other different kinds of programs to bring awareness and traffic to the brand. But when it's on, you know, an item and an eight foot set, um, what's, what does everything look like in between? So just, um, you know, having that, that dialed in awareness of how things are going and what, um, what you need to be doing to kind of uh, activate and maintain, um, you know, different strategies and performance. Thanks, thanks Kristen for, for that. One of the things that you said was really interesting is, you know, not, not trying to recreate the wheel around innovation, 
And yeah. I do feel that, you know, sometimes a lot of people go through big lengths to recreate the wheel and try to make their product unique. And, and this probably goes back to you know, your, your marketing degree coming into use, but you know, what do you, what do you, what do you feel that, you know, for the brands that are on today that are really early, you know, stage, you know, what's going to be the most, you know, compelling um, part, you know, what the compelling points that they need to really, you know, communicate in their deck and their time with the buyer that might set themselves apart from, you know, the other 600 submissions that a buyer will get in a category review. Totally. Um, know your category and know, um, you know, I see a lot of claims, both in quality, like this is, again, this is the best of the best of this thing, or claiming to have some fun function or health claim or things like that. So there's, you know, there's lots of ways to differentiate and, and innovate, but I think just being um, kind of just holistic and real about what that is and like finding um, just what makes it special. So it's, if maybe you're sourcing, maybe there's like a buzzy ingredient that you're using that gets into like a political, you know, sourcing ethical palm oil as an example, or um, how you're, maybe you source all of your ingredients from the state where you're producing. Like that to me is a compelling differentiator or innovation. Um, you know, keeping things in house and growing like a, an economy to bring this finished product to the shelf, um, or maybe some other mission that's kind of tied to um, your product category. So um, thinking of an example, like, like a candle maker employing at risk youth, or, um, you know, there's a lot of people making candles and soap out there. But um, how is this how is the purchase of this product making a positive impact on the community, um, whether it's local or national or, or, and that doesn't necessarily have to be something that's, um, you know, socialized on pack and like, tout, like advertised in a big way, but it's, it's still like makes you feel good as a buyer to know that um, I'm bringing this thing in and it's making a difference. And then ultimately the brand and this, you know, marketing strategy will then kind of um, do its job and speak to the customer in that same way where it just kind of grows organically from there that, you know, as a customer, you're looking at a set and you have all these choices. Like, um, like for me as, as a person and a consumer, I love trying new things and like the weird wonky ingredients and flavor for, for, profiles like pineapple habanero hot sauce or whatever it is but not everybody's like that so like how are other ways you can kind of stand out as a um as a product and a brand to help just tweak that decision in some way to um to any customer that's maybe just wanting to to feel good about their where they're putting their dollars uh, that's great thanks Kristen. then uh, yeah i think it was really great um, how you outlined, you know, the even just the differentiation in an in ingredient to make a product stand out. How do you see brands, you know, connecting with the, you know, with Whole Foods' customer? You know, how do they connect with the shopping behaviors of those customers looking for those brands? Because I think that's really where, you know, data comes in so valuable of really understanding of what are the trends, you know, whether it's ethically sourced or or regenerative ag. <clears throat> yeah, again, it's like a, a very tricky and delicate balance and tricky mix of like where, like a, a picture of Venn diagram of like value, values and quality. So every, most retailers have like a private label line um, where you'll see peppered throughout the store. And then there's, you know, a, a broad range of price points and different kinds of products, um, maybe differing in flavor profiles or quality ingredients. And obviously for, you know, a smaller emerging brand, the cost of goods is higher than it could be at, from an escalation to scale of like a more national or even private label product. So just how um, keeping up on like what folks are looking for. I mean, I think you know, at Whole Foods, 
the quality standards, ingredient standards are constantly evolving and just in, in line with outside entities like the USDA and um, FDA, you know, even like certain dietary studies. And when we think about allulose or erythritol, like you don't, you want to kind of keep a pulse on what, how you're making your product and comparing it to what's in the news and what doctors are saying, or um, you don't want ever want to be on the bad side of that news article. Um, and then at risk of potentially getting cut just because of, you know, we kind of want to stay ahead of that because it does take time to reformulate, repackage. Um, so yeah, I think again, just kind of balancing the where like the value values and quality in your product and making sure it's um, relevant and up, up, like current on what, what folks are looking for. And I think again, that's where data can help kind of identify um, you know, trends within your category. Yeah, absolutely. It, it absolutely can, Kristen. And we um, at Nielsen IQ have ingredient level attribution tracking. So if you are looking for some of those palm oil, you know, style attribution, we, we code that on the back of the ingredient panel. So you can kind of differentiate in your category, some of those key attributes and ingredients that you're looking for. How much of the market and how much of the category includes these type of ingredients? Is that segment growing? Is it not um, to even make some of those decisions early on as you're innovating, as you're, you know, creating new items um, and sourcing, you know, the ingredients for these? Thanks. Katrina, how are we doing for time? Looks like we've got, we could probably take some questions here. We've got 15 minutes and it looks like there's a few questions in the chat. It looks like Annie's uh, been answering some of them. Um, there's one question here. Are we able to identify how different promotional strategies and campaigns have, co have contributed to an increase or decrease in sales to help inform more of the decisions within the Visor platform? I know that there's there's some, you know, kind of more specifics about the platform that people are interested in. So maybe Annie, you could share a little bit more about what folks can expect, especially since they have access to free reports. Absolutely. So our templated reports span across different topics. So I covered very, very high level speed dating version of Pfizer. Um, but beyond even just the performance of category and brand we looked at, we have all of these different types of business questions that can be answered. Things around promotion, pricing, distribution. We include our panel, our home scan panel data to get some shopper insights. So yes, we can absolutely look at promotional strategies. I'm thinking of one report specifically that is a promotional effectiveness report where you can even gauge week by week where were the most efficient weeks to promote um, based on you know what happened in the last 13 weeks or whatever time period at whatever retailer you choose. Was that effective? Um, where do we need to make improvements? And we'll also even give you suggestions as to the optimal weeks for promotions. Awesome, thank you. Bobby, I actually have a question for you, if you don't mind me <laughs> popping in. Sure. Um, earlier, you, you, know, you touched on uh, really the funds that you need to go into retail. And I think this is for, you know, for all of you, but I'd love Bobby for you to kind of kick off uh, the answers to this question. How do you attempt to understand how much money you need to go into retail? And I think, uh, Kristen, what have you seen that is going, that are going to be obstacles for brands, right? So um, I, I know that there's some, some questions around that. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'll start if they're already in a distributor, then you know, take that piece off. But you know, really, if you're gonna go into a new retailer, let's say Whole Foods Market, you know, you're gonna have to have free fill. So that could be, you know, one case uh, minimum, could be two cases just you know, um, per SKU per store based on what category you're in. Um, and then <clears throat> you're gonna have to have, you know, at least uh, two to three promotions for your first year outline. So, and then there's also marketing plans that, you know, all retail banners have that, you know, some are required to participate, some are not. Uh, but it, again, it's about, you know, that investment of, of you being a great um, brand partner with the retailer to participate in, in all their programs, because, 
you know, the, the buyer, you know, the buyer's responsibility, you know, at most retail banners is that they get their brand signed up for as many marketing initiatives as possible to really kind of out, you know, outline that entire year's plan. So, you know, if you think about, you know, free fill, then you think about 50 cents off, you know, unit, um, then you think about, you know, anywhere from 1500 to, you know, 5k in, in marketing spend per quarter based on around those promotions, you know, so you could be you know, easily talking, you know, 35k for your first year um, of just, you know, getting on the shelf. Yeah, and just to riff off of that, um, I think Trina, you asked about, Bobby spoke a little bit about uh, up to the, getting on shelf and then thinking ahead in terms of what now and what to expect after that point. I think that's where I see brands maybe fall short a little bit in some and find some surprises. So reading contracts with any partner, whether it's an ingredient or like, um, um uh, raw ingredient source or distribution partner or marketing firm for your branding read your contracts um and ask a lot of questions be really curious be really familiar so you're not surprised because that is especially for an emerging brand one thing that i've seen um become a hardship is um i think a lot of retailers have different programs or uh waiving you know, when you think about like the cost of a food safety audit and the cost of, gosh, I'm trying to even think, um, like at Whole Foods, we do data capture with IX1, which is a third party, cost to host a demo in a store, cost to invest in your promotional strategy. Um, you know, just having that holistic view, asking questions, we've kind of gotten better at Whole Foods of, of laying out that groundwork up front and having like some toolkits so suppliers do know what to expect because I've worked I've been in this role for just over five years and I've worked the gamut of like lettuce growers to honey producers to like packaged protein powders that are in you know 100 doors so it's like a, a broad spectrum but everyone's kind of playing the same game in, in a matter of words so um yeah there's definitely been some growing pains of like you know if one retailer maybe waves free fill or there's been, you know, some different kind of things to leverage the, the barriers to entry to get on shelf, but knowing that that's not going to be the case forever, especially as a brand grows, just really um, be aware and familiar with what those things are and plan for it um, and get ahead of it. So, you know, unfortunately with the pandemic or maybe, maybe other factors, a lot of hangover there with costs of goods and, um, you know, just how different brands are kind of coming and popping in and out of the industry. Um, it's just been a really wild time that's still happening. Um, I'm seeing, you know, just, um, and I think part of it is brands just not really having the foresight to strategize and plan for the unknown, like have like, or things that could come, could just happen. Like nobody planned for the pandemic or bottle shortages or or slowdowns in cargo ships or whatever. You don't plan for that, but like, how do you be nimble enough to have not have that make or break yourself? And I want to awesome. touch Thanks on the data investment side, if I can, Katrina, um, because I know the perspective around Nielsen IQ is always, holy cow, so expensive. Well, yes, it is. It is a, It is expensive. Data is expensive. It's a cost. It's, it's a piece of driving your business forward. Um, but we are not here with Pfizer looking to sell to Kraft. We are not looking to sell to PepsiCo. We are looking to sell to you and you specifically. So our pricing is reflective of that. Um, I will say a full year subscription package can be as low as 11,000 a year. So that's a thousand dollar, you know, $1,900 a month um, to get full access to 12 reports a month. Um, but I will say that we have extremely flexible packaging. You can get as much as you need to the fact of unlimited reporting, all access to absolutely everything within the tool down to maybe we just need five reports a year. We meet you where you're at um, and have pricing that actually reflects that for our emerging brand segment. So we can make it 
democratized across all brands and and we're not we're not only playing to the the big guys of the of the CPG world. Awesome. Um actually just to just to build on what you said Annie, I it seems like there's a lot of potentially very specific questions that brands may have about Pfizer. So I think maybe as a, as a follow-up, maybe we can set up an office hours for people so that they can get a little bit grittier in some of the questions that they have. But one question that um, we get a lot at naturally is, at what point should you be getting data? I think that, you know, if we're talking about best practices and sort of supporting um, how brands are, are, are approaching their business, at what point should they be reaching out to you? And even at the earliest stages, what types mm -hmm. of data should they already be looking at, even if they, if even if they're still in R&D, right? Or if they're getting ready to launch one to two SKUs. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from hearing Kristen and Bobby's perspectives too, alongside mine, I mean, I obviously feel like I'm biased as a data provider, um, but hearing their sides as well, the earlier, the better. Um, that will give you some meat and some grit onto any pitch that you bring to a retailer. So if you are really focused on growing distribution, if you're really focused on maybe you're there and you're defending your distribution, you need that data and those, those fact-based points to make that defense uh, trustworthy. Um, so the earlier you can, the better. Um, like I said, we have a lot of flexible packaging. One-time reporting is a possibility. If you're like, hey, I'm really focused on Whole Foods and that's it right now. Come to us for some for one-off reporting. We can create you a, something custom, something needed for whatever your business need is um, to make sure that you've got that that backbone um, to go in as a category expert and somebody with a lot of knowledge. And since we're touching on best practice, Kristen, you also mentioned uh, something earlier. You were talking about how brands reach out to buyers. Um, oftentimes, you know, we get questions around cadence of outreach and types of messages within that outreach. So really trying to stay connected to the buyer. What communication best practices can you share to help both brands and buyers work together, right? I'm sure that the, the buyers to some extent want to hear from the brands if it is a high value communication, um, but you know, what, what, what does that look like and what types of best practices can you share in that? Oh, that's a big, great question. Um, so just speaking from my perspective, I think having empathy and awareness our number one and just you know again back to that, that kind of homework piece um and for me as a forager it's kind of a delicate balance of like i'm out looking for innovation but i have brands submitting to me all the time so i'm also you know reviewing and kind of filing and filtering um like an, it's a revolving door that's coming from all sides internally and externally um but uh, I think most retailers have a version of a category review calendar, and that is a good thing to get familiar with um, because it's just knowing when, like the right time and place um, to put your product in front of a buyer of when they're going to be, when they're thinking about that category, especially if there's, um, like myself as I'm more of a general, um, like we we have like condiments reviewed in a specific time of year, but I'm I have a, like a focus category in every round and every month, and I'm just constantly looking for, for new products, but knowing what's being reviewed and when, and when to submit, how to submit. Katrina shared the link to the supplier portal um, in the chat at the top. So find the version of that at um, each retailer you're interested in pitching. Um, but I also like to, even if I don't always respond, I also like to hear from brands when they're being featured in the news, or maybe there's been a new study released that is relevant to the brand that makes them you know they're getting some visibility on a broad scale. Um, I, I don't necessarily always come like find those on my own or come across them. I, it's My life is a very blurred line of like work and personal life when it comes to food and beverage, but um, I love hearing from brands of how they're, um, Kind of in the spotlight outside of my day to day, and then um, you know keeping up with the buyer on what you're working on. Um, so, like, let's say you've got three SKUs in stores, but you're R&Ding this 
this new thing and you're trying to enter into a new category. I love to know about those things and keep a pulse on it. So I've got it in my back pocket. Um, let's say, you know, we have the calendar, but maybe something um, for other circumstances is falling out of the assortment. And so I've got this thing that I can, I was like, all right, oh, I don't want to fill that space with and then have like a bank of things to pull from. But yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a million dollar question that I don't have a great answer to, but just having some like awareness and empathy of just, um, you know, not being a squeaky wheel, but coming at the right time with the right thing at the right place um, to your buyer and just building that relationship and understanding that they, they have a lot of other things going on. So you might not get a response. Um, and I did want to address Ryan's question too, because um, it's a it's a really important one um, with lo your local market. You know, we talked about um, you know R and Ding with your friends and family, um, and just how you can kind of organically grow a following from your home base. And I think that's a big piece with brands. You know, whether maybe you're manufacturing and self distributed in house, and you kind of just you have your hands on every process or piece of the piece of your brand's process. Um, but it's like sending a child off to college and like kind of, you know, you start to let go of that as you get, you know, your reins have to kind of loosen as you're spreading your wings and getting the brand out in front of, you know, kind of losing some control in some ways. So um, I think that's also where data can come into play of, um, like I, I work with a lot of brands that maybe start D to C. And even though I'm buying for maybe like a specific set of stores or geographic area, knowing that a brand I'm connected with has a strong following in like the, the New York market or maybe the Oregon market. Um, if you're, you know, shipping a lot of product out to those areas, I can easily ping my counterpart and be like, hey, look, this, I like this brand, their customers in this other place on your plate or on your desk. Um, here you go. I think, you know, we can, there's a lot of internal things happening behind the scenes. So I think that's another great reason to have um, a strong relationship with your points of contact to, to present like where you can win and how they can help you. Yeah. Awesome. And I think Ryan, that's a great question for all of us to end on. So Andy, I'd love for you to build on that and share what data brands should be looking at to go from regional to national. And I think Bobby, you know, I'm sure that there are a lot of brands that um, you're talking to and advising. What are some of the most common um, advice that you find yourself giving out, right? Everyone wants to grow and scale. So just wanted to end, I think that's a that's a great question. And also Andy, why don't we why don't we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. One of the best features with advisors that you'll have access to all of our markets. That includes all of our retailers, all of our channels, all of the divisions within each retailer, so all Whole Foods 11 divisions um, and our geographies. So if you are really local and focused on your geography, you can still se segment our market that way. If you are in that New York market and um, that's you know where you're local and, and that's where you're starting, great, start there. Use that data, use that geographic story to, to push your expansion strategy. Like Kristen said, stay in touch, keep those really good relationships. And if you're bringing good results for the local market, um, it should it should tell that story that there is room here to expand. If you're a good partner, if you've got the right data, um, it, it should be a simple story. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, the, <clears throat> that's a good point. And I would say velocity wins and um, you could be in several regions. Um, it could drag down your velocity and you could be, you could actually be on the, the point of being cut from the category because you have two regions bringing down your velocity. And you have to figure out how to balance those and support those. You know, Kristen talked about demos and some other things. And there might be some things that you have to set money aside to do and certain regions do that, but you know, the, the data that you'll need that data to really help you understand, you know, where, where your, your velocity is, is being dragged down because at the end of the day, um, you know, velocity is going to win in, in any retailer, but you know, the buyers, when they have such a big scope, you know, like I said, early in the call, you know, they're responsible for category growth, which is velocity and, and, and sales and profitability. So 
to be a good partner, you, you need both of those. You could, you could actually be a great partner, you know, in sales, but you know, if, if your margin, if they're not making the best margin on you, you're going to have to figure out a way to, 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 to reduce costs to get more profitable because they'll look for that next option to, to fill you with, um, uh, that will be more profitable. And so, and then just really, you know, focus on the innovation of the category and making sure that, you know, as you're tackling velocity, that you know all the competitors that are that are coming into the category across, you know, um, every grocery banner to really make sure that um, you're aware of that because you could be a, um, you know, you could be at the top and then, you know, a couple of new companies come in with a lot of, promotional money and can take away that velocity. So it's just really about always being aware, never rest on your laurels and use the data. I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Thank you so much. This is <clears throat> such a high impact conversation. I mean, I think we could go a whole a whole other hour. I, I know that I'm sure there's still more questions in the chat here. So just as a quick follow-up, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and set up an office hours with the NIQ team since I think there's a lot of appetite for that. And if you enjoyed this event, I know that there's a heavy attendance here between San Diego and Austin, um, but if you are um, in, in some of our other regions, check out the full calendar of all of the summer fun that's happening across all of the naturally chapters. And then um, we're also going to be kicking off a mid-year trends update here next week. So more on that soon, but thank you so much to everyone for attending and Chris and Bobby and Annie, thank you so much for your time. This is a great conversation. Have a great day, everyone. That's great. Likewise. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye. Take care.